Grace, mercy, and peace are yours. From God our Father, through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Speaking of summer being over, have you had a chance this summer to do any stargazing? Maybe if you were out camping or out in the countryside and at night when the stars come up and just light up the sky, to take some time to simply just look up. Some of my favorite childhood memories are about being in the farm down in Kansas, looking up and trying to count the stars in heaven. It's a daunting task. Scientists estimate that there are over a hundred billion stars just in the Milky Way galaxy that bright strip through the middle of the night sky. All those other tiny dots, maybe invisible to the human eye, but there are over 10 billion other galaxies out there, and, and we keep discovering more as we reach further and further out into space. All told, scientists estimate that there is over one billion trillion stars in the known universe. That is one with 21 zeros following it. Good luck counting the stars. There's something comforting, though, about looking up at the night sky. Something comforting that, that God gave to Abraham, or pardon me, Abram, one night and that he gives to us when he just invites us to look up to the heavens. We consider these words as we meditate on these verses from Genesis chapter 15, verses 1 through 6. I invite you to stand as we read as follows in Jesus' name. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. But Abram said, O sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless and the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus? And Abram said, You have given me no children. So a servant in my household will be my heir. Then the word of the Lord came to him. This man will not be your heir, but a son coming from your own body will be your heir. He took him outside and said, Look up at the heavens and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. Abram believed the Lord, and he credited it to him as righteousness. We pray. These are your words. Heavenly Father, make us holy by the truth. Your word is truth. Amen. You may be seated. I am not a handyman. I've tried before. Uh, one, of, one of my great failures actually came just a few months ago. Uh, when my wife and I had, had first moved into our townhome, I was mounting racking in our garage to hang all the tools and rakes and brooms and stuff from. And, and so in order to mount this racking, you have to find the studs behind the wall. Kids, studs are, are boards that you can't see. They're there. You have to try and hit them with a screw so that what you're hanging on the wall will stay put. I thought I had mounted it correctly. But um, <clears throat> a few months ago, we heard a crash. <laughs> Go figure. I, I must have just missed or just barely nicked the stud just enough to keep it up there, but it didn't support that weight very long. Now the reason I, I tell you that is because 
When we look at Abraham, we always assume that Abraham is this really well-put-together man. We look at him as this pillar of faith, this guy who had all the answers. And yet today, as the Lord comes to Abraham, we see the very first thing that God says to Abram is, Don't be afraid. Now, what's interesting is that these words come now. You see, Abram, uh, before this, Abram had been called from his home country uh, to live in what's now the promised land or the land of Israel. He had to journey, leave his home behind into a new and live in a new strange land. Uh, shortly before this, Abram was sojourning in Egypt for a while, and he lied to the Pharaoh of Egypt, the most powerful person in the world, and he escaped with his life. A little bit before this, uh, Lot, his nephew, and the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah were captured by an invading army. Abram takes 318 of his trained men. He chases them down, defeats them, rescues Lot and the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, and they all return back. After all of this, God comes to Abram and says, Don't be afraid. So what did... Abram really fear? The answer is right here. He said, Lord, what can you give me since I am without a child? Why would you be afraid of not having a child? See, all of Abram's hopes and dreams hung on just one single hope that he could have a child. And we can almost imagine how, how that would affect how Abram would even see himself questioning his own vitality. Why, why can't I have kids? Worried about maybe his name disappearing. No one to carry on his name. No children for himself. Abram was afraid. It's very much a feeling we get when the things that we count on in this life disappoint us, when they fall short. We hang all of our hopes and dreams on something and, and, and then it collapses before our eyes. really sad example of this is my, my wife's hometown in, in Norseland. Just a couple weeks ago, uh, a young man was tragically killed in a farming accident. He was 18 years old. He was looking ahead to his senior year of high school. If you think of all the things that, that kids have planned for their future, planned for their senior year to suddenly end just a couple weeks before school started. And, and it shook the whole community to its very foundation, to its very core. Because here's this image of vitality, of youthfulness, suddenly just snatched away. What other things do we count on in our life? Always being there. Not just youth, but maybe even our, our own bodies, our own health. Um, our bodies as they age can constantly disappoint us, can, can leave us feeling empty. Maybe it's a disappointment of of living in a culture that tells us that if you're not happy all the time, then something's wrong, that you're flawed and defective. Or it could be that very real struggle against our own desire to live a godly life. We make promises to ourselves that I'm going to be a better husband, or I'm going to be a better wife or spouse, I'm going to be a better son or daughter, I'm going to be a better Christian. And time and time again, those promises fall short. They collapse before our eyes. It's not enough. That's why God comes to Abram, says, Do not be afraid. I'm your shield, your very great reward. 
God tells Abram, this, this guy who had it all, he had money, he had a beautiful wife, you, you would think that his life was so well put together, but, but God comes to him and, and tells him that in absence of the one thing your heart desires the most, this, this child, God comes to him and says, I will be your reward. I'm going to be the one to fill you up, to satisfy you. And you can think of that with your own prayer life too. Sometimes when we struggle in prayer over something that that God oftentimes will will answer our prayers better than we can even think or imagine. But it's all in his timing. In Abraham's case, he wanted a child, so God brings him outside. And and we can only imagine in, in, in the desert climate, in a high elevation with no light pollution, How stunning the night sky must have been that Abraham saw that night. God tells him, look up, count the stars if you can, so shall your offspring be. God kept his promise to Abram. God filled him up. In his own time, God gave Abram not one son, but eight sons. And as far as we know, each one of those children became their own nation. Ishmael became the father of the people that live in Saudi Arabia. Isaac, the son of the promise, became the father of the nations of of Israel and Edom. And then in Genesis 25, we find out that Abram married again, and he had his wife's name was Keturah, and she bore him six more sons. We can only speculate how many nations, how many millions of people today are descendants of the sons of Keturah. But even if we were to count up all of those descendants together, it probably still wouldn't add up to even a fraction of the stars in the night sky. Now actually, if we, as we look at these verses, uh, what's really beautiful about these is when God comes to Abram, he's talking about his, his offspring, his descendants, his seed. Uh, he uses a singular noun. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 8, Paul points back to that and says, God doesn't say, so shall your seeds be, or so shall your descendants be, but so shall your seed be. He's not talking about many, but just one person, just one son who would fulfill this promise. Who would be greater than the heavens. And that single descendant is Jesus Christ. True man and true God. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 10 tells us uh, of of Jesus that that he is the one who has ascended into heaven to fill the whole universe. So when God points to Abraham to the night sky and says, so shall your seed be. Abram understood that God was talking about the single descendant, Jesus Christ, through whom all nations would be blessed. That his offspring, someone from his own body, would be both true man and true God. The last verse of these verses, Abram believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. That's one of the most important verses of the Old Testament. People often ask, how were the Old Testament saints saved before Jesus came and died on the cross? And the answer is right here. They were saved through faith in Jesus. Abram believed God. He believed God's promise. Not just a promise about how many children he would have, but God's promise about the Savior. And God credited it to him as Righteousness. Through faith, not through his own works, but through faith, God saw Abram and said, Your sins are forgiven through Jesus. Abram believed. 
Our whole life as Christians hangs really on that single word, belief. What's neat is you already know that word in Hebrew. The word is amen. Believe means amen. Sometimes in Hebrew it's used as a a firm place, a a place where you would actually pound a nail into even, a place that can carry your weight. So at the end of prayers, we say the phrase, the word amen, let it be, or so be it, to express a firm belief that those words are true. We believe it. We believe the promises of God. Of course, the one place where all of our hopes, all of our dreams, all of our future life hangs is on the cross of Jesus, where God's own Son, the one who is greater than all the hosts of heaven, all the starry hosts, who knows them all by name, hung on that cross for you and for me, where he died for our sins. That's our amen. We believe it. We say, Lord, so be it. You are my Savior. You are my God. You are the one who will carry me through all the troubles, all the burdens, everything that life has to face. And all the times life disappoints us. That's a comfort that we have, looking up at the stars in the night sky. Sometimes it makes us feel small. Sometimes it makes our problems feel small. But more importantly, every time we look up at the night sky, we remember that the Lord who fills heavens and the earth came down to die for me. That you and I were so important to him, as small as we are in the grand scheme of the universe, we were so important for him that God would die for us. To assure us of our eternal home in heaven. So be it. Amen. Now may the peace of God which passes all understanding guard and keep your hearts and minds. In Christ Jesus our Savior. Amen.